Um, I'll try to keep you entertained on a Friday night. I hope that this goes well. Um, it's a smaller crowd, so if you have questions, just feel right ahead to just jump right in. Um, I will open it up to questions at the end, but um, if you have something that you want to jump in right in the middle, middle that's fine. So to start off with, what is Inception? Um, last year, around August, we found a targeted attack that was done by what looks to be a nation state. I, I don't want to come out and say it, it was a nation state, but it's likely there was a nation state attack. And we called it Inception because there's so many layers to this. When we get through one layer, we'd find there's another layer even deeper. And as I go through this presentation, I hope you'll, you'll kind of appreciate why we named it this. So based on information we were able to gather, these are the targets, not all of them, but the, the majority of them fall right on this map in this region. And you can see there's a very large cluster right over Moscow. So this is who they were targeting and who their targets of interest were. Also note the industries that they were after. They were after government. Uh, they were after embassies. At, a lot of the else embassies were in the Moscow area, um, military secrets. They, and then towards the uh, end of the campaign, we released this in, we re released our findings in December. And within 48 hours, they had shut the whole thing down. But towards the end of this campaign, they were, they were targeting the, the World Petroleum Council and the United Nations members as well. Now, their attacks were typically started out with a phishing email, but they were very specific phishing emails. Um, if you look at these emails, uh, the one furthest on the left is a United Nations document, uh, and it outlines an agenda for a meeting. So you, you can assume that the message would be some, to the extent of, there's been an update to our meeting. Please see the updated agenda with this attached Word document. You'd open the Word document, and they would exploit you. And then it would show one of these documents not so that the user was not suspicious when Word crashed. Right? It would quickly launch another copy of Word and throw down these legit documents to kind of hide what they're doing on the background. The one in the middle shows Russian leadership. It was sent to Russian military personnel. Um, the one down the bottom is a diplomatic car for sale, obviously targeting a diplomat in that area, which was Moscow. This document over on this side is one of my favorites. You can't see it, but it talks about diesel engines. And it's a, it's a customer product saying, hey, we sell these type of diesel engines. Here's our latest brochure. And so we started looking at who would be a customer of this size diesel engine. And we went to, that, we went to their site and tried to find out information about the, these engines. And it turns out that these are huge engines. These are the kinds that are used in submarines and to start nuclear generators. So these are the people, those are the types of people that this document was targeting. I say they were all very targeted documents. We see this little, this little lady here. Um, she didn't seem to be a, such a targeted document. Um, just kind of talking about maybe future Miss Russia, but uh, effective nonetheless. Maybe they did know their target, and they, they knew they'd be interested in such a thing. But guys aren't the only ones that were susceptible. Uh, deal for Victoria's Secrets was another attack they used, and it also was successful. So how the attack plays out is they send an email that has this attachment on it, right? The user clicks the attachment, which is a malicious Word document. It exploited an exploit that came out last April, almost a year ago now, that um, it'll, they get a shell prompt. And when they get shell access, they do two things. They drop a VB script and run it, and then they open that decoy document so, to show the user. That the VB script will then extract from within itself two different files. One DLL and another one is an AES encrypted file and drop both of them to disk and then execute and put the DLL in the startup. That DLL, when it's run, it's a polymorphed DLL. It's a, using a type of packer we haven't seen before. It was unique only to these guys and it would, every instance of that polymorphed DLL was completely different no matter what the underlying payload was. It would inject into itself functions that were logarithmic or exponent functions. And there were a lot of function trees that were just dynamic, like the number of function arguments to these functions was different between each pack. So the, the polymorphic packer they used was really, really quite sophisticated, excuse me. But nonetheless, it, once it finally finished this thing, it unpacked the DLL in memory, and that DLL then would go find the encrypted blob. That DLL had the AES key for that blob, decrypt it, which was yet another DLL, and then load that into memory and run it, which was, that was the actual payload to this tool. The whole chain here is just to get to this base implant. The base implant then had the capability to call home, say, hey, what do you want me to do? And it would pull down additional capabilities and run them as, as the targets, as the attackers wished. Um, 
interesting to point out is everything below this red line only exists in memory. There's no forensic evidence for these files. So all you have on disk is an AES encrypted blob, which is <laughs> good luck opening that, and a polymorphic DLL. They did very, they did a lot of work to protect their actual payload and hide what they were doing. They didn't use a, tip, a lot of the typical malware tricks of you know trying to hide from a reverse engineer or using custom packers. And I think the reason that they didn't is because those tricks, although they slow down reverse engineers and buy them time, they're also very loud and say, hey, I'm trying to hide. So they, they didn't this route instead to not raise suspicion upon themselves. So the base implant, when it would call home, here's the kind of information it would, it would send home. On the, on the far left is a basic, we, we'll, what we'd call a survey data. It would beacon this back home. Same things like computer name, the username, is he an admin? Um, it would also send home the language of the machine, the language of the user, and just that's, I think those were just to kind of verify that they're hitting the target they suspect they are. With that information calling home, then if they thought they were interested in that target, they would send, task the target to do two new things. They'd task it to do a complete dir walk and give me domain information for that user. Then, if they felt like they were still interested in that target, then they'd advance to the third and final stage that we saw, which way they'd, they'd start to pull back the list of software, the complete device list of the machine, and they'd start pulling back PDFs, P, uh, PowerPoints, Excels, Word documents from the target. So it, it's clear that they were after espionage. They weren't after any kind of sabotage. We didn't, we didn't witness any, at least. But they were clearly looking to steal information from their targets. And they were very cautious of who they were targeting. They would only expose or use these tricks on targets they knew they wanted. During, during the course of this investigation, we tried to fish them, right? We tried to set up these machines and tried to get them to target us to see what they would do. And I could never get them to bite. So they were very good at making sure they hit who they thought they were trying to hit. Now, how it talked home was really interesting for me because this is not something you typically see in malware. Rather than you know, opening Inner Explorer or using a socket, what it did is it mapped a web dev drive, right? So like, if I did a net use on the machine, you'd see a web dev drive out to the cloud. And that through that drive, it would send up a file or retrieve a file. Because you use a web dev drive, the connection doesn't come from the malicious process. The connection comes from the system itself. Furthermore, it's Microsoft doing it, right? You just say, oh, I've got a net drive. Write this file to the drive, and the system will go send the data up to the cloud for you. It's very sly. A lot of AV products aren't looking for this type of traffic. Now, the web dev provider they used is CloudMe, which was something I had never heard of before. They are a Russian, um, or a Swedish, excuse me, cloud provider. Uh, that's probably why I didn't hear of them, because I'm not, I'm not frequently in that area. But how they designed the malware, that's not hard-coded. In fact, it could be changed. And it could have been changed to any one of these providers that uses WebDAV. So it could have talked to any one of these, and you know, the malware could be in interchangeably set up. If we look at it, I can show you exactly where. This is the configuration section. Every one of the payloads we saw was almost the same, except for one section, which is the config, which was hard-baked in it. That's really small, but the config outlines the URL to talk to, which is the top one says basically CloudMe, the username, the password, and then the paths of where to set survey data down and the path of where to get my next tasking assignment from. And then when it writes files to the cloud, it has this last section that says use one of these extensions when you write the file. So that if I was to casually browse CloudMe, I would see all these files that look like a text file, a WAV file. Right? It, they, CloudMe just throws this icon up for you, guessing based on the extension. Really, all those are is that survey information that I showed you before, but encrypted and set on the cloud. So that's kind of how they, they hide this fact that they're there. So we observed them, and because every time I get a hold of a sample, I could see from that sample the username and password that they were using. So I wrote a Python script just to check CloudMe and say, with this, see, see what gets uploaded and see if they're tasking this guy, see what they're doing, that exchange. And I started to build a collection of these. But then I started seeing something strange happen. In some cases, they would drop this SCCM executable on their target. And I looked at that executable, and I started taking it apart, and I recognized it immediately as a, a Chinese piece of malware, a known APT set from long ago. And, I was, and it's not a particularly advanced piece of malware in my mind. But compared to the inception setup, it's, it's like 
like miniature, right? It's, it doesn't have a lot of these awesome capabilities. It's loud, it's obnoxious, and it just doesn't make sense to load a backdoor on a system when I already have this really cool, sophisticated backdoor. Like, why would I set this really noisy, odd one down? Is it the Chinese like experience group teaching a younger group? Are they kind of working together? Like, I didn't understand why, why, why they would do this. And then I started to look at the cases of where this was being dropped. And I noticed a pattern in the survey files. In the cases where the SCCM was being dropped, the, the survey was saying it was running out of the, one of these processes. In the cases where it wasn't being dropped, this, this is a typical place where the, the malware expects to be running from. But down here below, I don't know if you can read this, it's OLI, right, or run DLL32. So what they were able to figure out, based on where the process was running, they could tell this is, a, this is a researcher onto our trail. This is a researcher looking at our stuff. When there was a researcher onto them, they would drop a piece of Chinese malware. Oh, we're the Chinese. Look at who we are. That was, that was my first clue that these guys are a little on top of their game, right? They know what they're doing. They know how to play with us. And I thought, OK, this is a little cat and mouse game. You're on, right? You're on. So, we started to collect a number of samples, and we, got, we gave them a number of account information, and we sent this, we reached out to CloudMe and told them, hey, your service is being used by this APT to attack these large organizations. Would you be willing to share log data for these accounts? Who's logging in? We'd like to find out who the attackers are that are attacking the, these machines. Luckily, CloudMe was willing, luckily for us, CloudMe was willing to share and work with us. They, they worked to shut down the accounts, and they worked to provide the logs to those accounts that we specified. But furthermore, they said, that's also matching a pattern of these hundred some odd other accounts that you didn't list. So it, it revealed to us that these guys are huge. But when, and when we got the logs back, we got the IPs, and it was easy for us to tell who's a victim IP versus who's an attacker IP based on user agent and what actions, what commands they used, right? And we get all these IPs, but it turns out there was over 100 IPs that the attackers were using. And it was crazy because the attackers would, it would connect to CloudMe, check a few accounts, and then connect from a different IP, check a few more. It would just bounce through these IPs, like just jump. Every hour or so, it would jump to a new IP, but continue talking as if it was the same connection. And we we're like, whoa, these guys got this massive network. And it's like, it's probably just Tor. No, none of these IPs lined up to be a Tor IP. We're like, well, is it some kind of proxy service? They're not proxy IPs. They were not any kind of service or known proxy or open proxy that we could find. We're like, well, what is this? I mean, a lot of them were in South Korea. Does that mean anything? Because the, re the rest of them were all over. But there was a good portion that centered around South Korea. So we started to do just a light forensics on the boxes. And it turned out they were all embedded systems. They were all embedded systems that these guys have compromised and that we're using them to cover their tracks, right? So to cloud me, it's like, oh, these are just a bunch of home user IPs. These all belong to just user router IP addresses. It looks perfectly legit for a user to log in, sync a file or two, and, and shut it down. It was like, whoa, these guys are, oh. Like, I thought I had them, and then no. All I get is a bunch of these router boxes. So the good news for us is, though, we were, we were able to identify a customer of our uh, Bluecoat, and we reached out and asked for permission, and we were able to get access to one of these devices. So I get Telnet or SSH access to one of these boxes, and I look, you know, I do a PS and I do a NetStat, and right away something looks rather fishy. This it's really small, but it says Tel Dash. The process called Tel Dash has a port open. Yeah, I don't think Tel should be listening on any port, right? That that's shady in and of itself. Furthermore, the process Tel is running out of slash temp. I'm like, yeah, this is wrong. This is my guy right here. But then I'm like, how do I get an executable off this router? I can't just stick a USB drive in it. Um, maybe I could just SCP it to myself. No, this router is an embedded Linux. It's not got the full suite of things, right? It's like BusyBox, even that slimmed down. It doesn't have SCP. I'm like, well, what about FTP? Uh, TFTP? Um, can I like echo it to a terminal and just cut and paste? Uh, no, that doesn't work. I, oh, or netcat. It doesn't even have netcat. I couldn't even echo it to a terminal, and there's like the dash E option to escape the character so it doesn't beep and do funky stuff. No, that won't work. I'm like, great. Find the super cool malware, and I can't even copy the file off the router. Like, how dumb do I feel, right? 
So if you guys got a cool answer for this, I'd love to hear it afterwards. I came up with one, but I don't think it's the most elegant. So if you got something better, I'd love to hear it. What I ended up doing is I compiled a new version of BusyBox that had dub, that that had netcat in it. Wgat, wgat, does that make sense? Wgit the file down to the router and then run that just to netcat my the malware off the router. Even then, my pains weren't over because the router runs MIPS, right? Who, the last time I reversed MIPS assembly was like in college because I had to. Like MIPS, MIPS is ugh, it's horrible. But anyways. I took it apart, got it out, and found out yeah, exactly what I thought it was. It's a backdoor proxy on the router. It listens on a port for an encrypted session. The, the router, the attacker will connect on that port, say, hey, open me up a proxy to this address. And then it would proxy traffic through the router. And that's how they were masking their identity. So to kind of back up and get the big picture of what we know so far, right? the victim connects to CloudMe to get its commanding, to get its command of control. CloudMe is connected to by this one of these huge internet of things that have been hacked. And I thought, I got net stat logs. I can see who's connecting to those routers. Well, all of the connections to those routers come from one of four servers that were all virtual private servers rented in the cloud. Uh, none of those, we reached out to the providers, asked for information. They weren't willing to share anything about their customers. So this is their huge network that we've Device, and I don't even know what's on this half of the field over here, right? I just know it stops there somewhere. They could have four or five more layers. I don't know. But it's, it's just interesting to see how strong and how big their network is, right? So I'm thinking, okay, so I've got control of one of these devices, and I can see the traffic going through it. What if I made that guy a double agent? Every time he was tasked to go somewhere, everything he's doing, Send me a PCAP copy of wherever he goes. All right? So you always hear about nation states spying on the little guys. This time it's the little guys spying on the nation state. I kind of I, I get giddy even talking about this now because it's just kind of cool just to think, aha, this whole campaign, and I'm watching the whole thing go by. So I knew all the connections to CloudMe were encrypted, and, and so that I didn't expect to see anything there, but I was wondering what else would I see? And what I found out is they had some rented email servers. Whenever they'd spend a send a spam, they'd connect to the rented email server through their Internet of Things network and then send out the email. So I could get a Wireshark capture of every attack email that went through my one particular router. So here's, here's an example of one of those. Um, I've blotted out who the target was, but uh, other than that, I, it was pretty cool. I could see the attachment. I could see who they were targeting. This one was after... Uh, who is this one after? I don't see it readily. Um, but yeah, I, I was able to see who it was. I was able to see who their email servers masqueraded as. And they would masquerade as, as common UK customers, right? So they were, they were faking sandygroup.co.com by using the domain sandygroup.co.uk. For somebody in the UK, that address makes sense. So they were, they were very good at spoofing who they were trying to target and who they were coming from. Now, as I was listening in on their network like this, I saw a lot of emails that matched this setup with the Word document attached that exploited. But then I started to see some emails that didn't match this pattern. I saw a small little one-liner email, no attachment. It's just like, hey, your WhatsApp app is out of date, or you know, get the latest WhatsApp app. It works for iPhone, Android, Blackberry, and Windows phones. And then a link. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, it's a phishing link. Well, let's see where it goes. I get the link and it takes me to BBC. No, no, that's not right. Something's wrong here. So I read it again. It says, works for iPhone, Android, and Blackberry, and Windows Phone. So if I change my user agent to Android and click that link, what happens? Ooh, I get an Android APK. Like, okay, okay. What if I change my user agent to iPhone? I get an iPhone Cydia package. Change my user agent to BlackBerry. Oh, I get a BlackBerry installer. I'm like, okay. Change my user agent to Windows Mobile. It takes me to BBC. Nobody has a Windows Mobile phone. Come on. <laughs> Why waste your time writing malware for it? So, looking at that link, it's actually a Bitly link. It's, it was a Bitly link that had this kind of pattern. That is, it went you to this IP address, and the URL had two things in it. It had a target identifier to uniquely identify this email so the attackers could know which ones worked, and then an action code. 
And the action code was either 743, which means serve the WhatsApp app that I got, or 124, which means serve the malware disguised as a Viber update, or another number, which meant serve the fish MMS phishing content. Um, the MMS phishing content would look, would look something like this. It would take you to this page that showed a teleprovider's logo and then a password block and says get MMS. If you put in the password and get MS, it would get you the malware. But um, pr what we also found is they had logos for all these different car carriers. So what we presume this was, it was an MMS phishing. They, so they'd send an, a message to the target saying, you've received an MMS message that's too big for your inbox, right? Go to this link and download it. Your password is X. And then you go to that link, and it would show you your carrier's logo, because they could figure out you know, who they were targeting. So you'd see a Sprint logo or whatnot, and you'd enter your password and get, and get nailed with the malware. So they had a fish, a MMS, or SMS phishing, excuse me, MMS phishing campaign as well. Now, here's the cool thing about Bitly, right? It keeps statistics about links. It keeps who the user is that submitted these. So when I looked up the user, I saw that he had over 10,000 links made on his site since July of 14. And this was in November when I had looked this up. So 10,000 links in that short of time. And they all appeared to go to BBC. Right? We all know what they were really doing on the back end. Furthermore, though, Bitly will also tell you how effective your links are being clicked on and by which countries. So I also, Bitly provided me statistics about how big this campaign is and who they were targeting. Now, this map's going to be slightly skewed because if you click the link from your Sprint phone, it's going to go through your carrier's location, right? So like Russia is, is a lot lighter because Russia doesn't really have that many carriers located in Russia. A lot of them are in the UK, but they provide services to Russia. So the IPs are kind of being, going to be skewed for mobile, but it gives you still a rough idea of, of who's clicking their links and it, that they are effective, at least to some. So let me dig into the malware a little bit. The Android malware. Uh, it disguises itself as a WhatsApp update. As soon as you run it, then it shows you this nice little screen and then disappears. And in the background, it's installed itself as a background service. It starts up every time the phone starts up. It is able to pull your location, your contacts. It's able to record audio. It's able to look at phone logs, MMS logs. The record audio is creepy, man. It's like, just turn the mic on for 10 minutes, tell me what I hear, and leave. Right? They had location information, so they could be like, Oh, look, he's at location X. We're really interested in location X. Turn on the mic. All right, turn it off. We're good. So they could do some really creepy things. And even more, is the malware it was very sly about how it would call home. What it would do is it would go look for a Tumblr blog. And it would look for a user's blog and read his blog post. This blog is some guy's post. This was the post. And it starts out fine, but then there's, you know, I don't know if you can read it, but this whole blog right here is just a bunch of gibberish. If you look at the source code, it's wrapped in HTML tags. And the Android phone knows to look for those tags, decrypt the data in between those tags, which is actually command and control information. So this blog post says, your real command and control server is located at X. Please use this address and these passwords to talk to the command and control place. So really, what would happen is that was just the first tier. It would redirect them to a, a hacked website, which then they would use to use the you know use a, a path that the the user of that website doesn't know about to communicate what they want the Android malware to do, and it would check not just one blog post, but it would check one of a number of different places to get its configuration information. So you would have to block this. You would have to block every one of those blog sites. Yeah, good luck blocking Tumblr, not having somebody complain. And then at, if you could block their hack sites. But if you blocked a hack site, they could just put a new hack site up and a new blog post telling the malware to go to the new hack site. So it was really easy for them to change where the command and control was. In case they get caught or the site gets, they, they get found out on that hack site, they can just throw down a new hack site and change where the malware is communicating. Really kind of a sly design. I really, it's kind of impressive. So the iOS malware was also interesting. Uh, it did require the phone to be jailbroke, uh, which, I mean, to us in the US, it's like, who, who jailbreaks their phone? But it actually is more common outside the US to jailbreak your phone than it is in the US. But anyways, so the, Android, the iOS malware wasn't as rich as the Android malware, but it still could pull your basic iTunes information. You could pull your contacts, hardware information about the phone, look at your SMS messages, call log, calendar, that sort of thing. Now, when you root your Android phone, Android 
iOS, or excuse me, when you read your iOS phone, iOS is really just like a support of OS X, right? And so OS X still has some root in BSD, and so when you, we root it, it, Cydia allows you to inst install Debian installers. And that's what a Cydia package really is, it's just a Debian package. So the malware, this is the breakdown of the malware. Um, really, all the control section is, is just telling the Debian package how to install it and what to do once it's, the files are dropped. And this is actually the files that get dropped to disk. So there's a Skype app that gets dropped, a binary called comsvib, and then another Debian package, d.b. So if you start to look at this, the, the post install information is basically just say, hey, once you're installed, change comsvib to executable, change its owner to will, which is the root user on iOS, and then run it. So that, and all comsvib is, is actually just a small little script that says sleep for 10 seconds and then install the debd Debian package. So we look at the debd Debian package. What's inside it? Well, again, we've got another uh, post install, and we have this, a com apple tor plist file, and then a c binary file, and two other little files by it. So the post install, this time, after you copy those files down, uh, change this bin slash c file to root owner, make it executable, uh, change the permissions on the tor apple plist, and then remove the, the comms file that I'm running right now, remove the Debian package. So it's just cleaning up the first mess and then installing this message. Now, if you're not familiar with Windows, with Mac OS or iOS, this launch daemons plist, a plist is like a dictionary for Apple, and that launch daemons is basically the directory where you put things, you say, hey, I want this to run in startup. And so we look at that, and sure enough, that's what it says. It says, hey, run user bin C on startup. Run it load. Every time the phone reboots, run this program in the background. Now with iOS, you, unless with, with it's rooted, you have to have some kind of way of monitoring this, but you typically aren't looking at your system process or what threads are running, right? So this is hiding in the background where nobody's going to see it unless they're really trying to find it. And sure enough, we look at file C, and it is, it's a Mako binary. It would work on, um, interesting enough, it was compiled, it doesn't show you there, but it was actually compiled for iOS 7 and later. So we can tell they were targeting newer iPhones. You got to have at least a 7 or newer for it to work. But it did work on the 64-bit, so it worked on the really new stuff. And then just in passing, we'll talk about the BlackBerry malware. When I saw it, I was like, BlackBerry? Who writes malware for, who uses a BlackBerry anymore, right? Like, I don't see these things very often. And I, it took me a little bit to, to get my head around reading the malware, reading, just reversing a BlackBerry app in the first place. Um, it didn't have as many features as the others. It was really slim. Um, it pull account information. What it really could do is it could pull complete hardware information. I mean, it could pull stuff down to the temperature of the phone in your pocket. Why the attackers cared how hot your phone is, I don't know. Maybe they wanted to know if you were inside or outside so they knew if their missile would hit you. I don't know. But they could pull such things, and they did. They pulled the temperature of your phone. They pulled address book, carrier information, and the list of installed apps. So just kind of, I never actually saw this one tasked or used, but they had the capability. Whether they ever found a target that had a BlackBerry, I don't know. So. As we started finding these malware pieces, they had a lot of little tricks in them, though, that, you know, once I saw the SCC, SCCM file, the, the Chinese malware, I knew that these guys were sly. And as we started to find artifacts, you know, typically as a reverser, I'm looking for these artifacts that clues to see who's behind this. But when I know they're throwing things in there to throw me off, I have to double, I have to second guess every clue I see now, because did they throw that in there on purpose, or was that in there to throw me off? And sure enough, there's a lot of these. So the iOS malware, it had the compile path, and in the compile path shows the username of John Clerk. I could believe that. That's plausible. But um, the BlackBerry malware had, inside of it, it used a string as a, kind of a key token that was, God save the queen. Like, yeah, I think that one's in there as a fake, right? I'm just going to put God save the queen in there because I'm so patriotic. I, I, don't, I think that's in there to just kind of throw us off. In the Android malware, you would see some strings that are, um, I think that one's Farsi. So Arabic, do they have Arabic developers working on this? And then again, in the BlackBerry malware, in another spot, there was Hindi characters. So they have Hindi, UK, Arabic, and Chinese. Like, just getting to trying to figure out who's behind this was really kind of shady. I don't know if I can believe any of those tricks. 
another one is they use this really long string, which looks like a keyboard smash, to generate a, a hash for a password. And based on that keyboard smash, the characters that are there, it tells me that they had a US keyboard. So right, like the, uh, the caret, the dollar sign, the hash, those are only on the, the standard keyboard layout for a US or a US international keyboard. Maybe that's a clue, maybe not, I don't know. These ones, I all kind of had to throw out. I, I just couldn't put any, any r r trust into them. But there were some clues that I felt like I could get. So with the CloudMe accounts, and I could see when tasking was, a, when they put up a task for their malware, I could see what time of the day that was put there. And I kind of gathered that information for the, the periods of time, and I noticed it, it corresponds to about an eight hour window. I'm like, okay, well what eight hour window does that, what time zone does that eight hour window line up from like eight to five? And it turns out that that, time, that would line up with GMT2, which is this red time zone right here. Um, also, we'll just keep that in mind, we'll, we'll come back to that. Also, when they would at, task their malware, the, the name of the file would be like 11239.bin. And then later we'd see one that's like 1123, oh, I guess nothing comes up right, 11, 31.bin. And so they were kind of incrementing their files each time they do a tasking. Now, I didn't have privilege to all their accounts, but I could check one one night and then check again the next night and see how much that number's incremented. And I'd be like, okay, so over that 24, power, 24 hour period, it looks like they tasked 100 different samples. So that means they've got at least 100 different active targets they're working in, where they're working at this moment every day. Right, by the time that this thing was over, that number was up almost to 10,000. That's how many different taskings they've done with their malware over those few months. Like these guys were serious, and because I knew they were targeted, that meant they weren't just hitting everybody, but they had that many specific targets that they were actually able to get what they wanted from, or at least get in on. Um, did I say everything on that slide? I think so. Um, also, there were some other similarities. Um, Kaspersky, so we, we correlated with Kaspersky, our, we shared our notes before we were released public, and Kaspersky was kind enough to say, you know what, this resembles one of our previous campaigns that we discovered called Red October. And we look, and there are some, there are some key similarities. First off, these phishing documents look fairly similar. The one, is, the one on the left is from Red October, and the one on the right is from Inception Campaign. Right, same kind of, here, here's a diplomatic car. Now, that's not a strong indicator because it's easy for me to take somebody else's malware, repurpose it for my uses, and send it out. Um, there were also some indicators, like they used this particular string to key where their shell code was in the, in the document, and that particular string was the same for both Red October and um, Inception. And then there was some code shared between them which was used for compression that looked exactly the same, same kind of function argument, and, and the code library is the same. Now that's not, all three of those aren't really the strongest in indicators, but they are pretty strong indicators. Furthermore, if we remember,
and down. It was it was pretty easy to detect when that's dropped. Yeah. That file deletes itself. Did I kick something out or should I use this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty easy to detect when you knew you had it. When it runs, it deletes itself, so you have a small window to hit it. But virus AVs should be able to catch that. And the, the, the thing is, I don't. These guys aren't active anymore, right? Like we were watching their things, and like I said, 48 hours within the release of the report, they shut it down. A lot of the malware was still calling home, but nobody was answering. And even the proxies, even, even the the router, I saw no more traffic through it anymore. So they were they were very cautious, and we knew once we released, they'd probably shut down. We knew that they were so risk adverse that that was that was their forte. There any, there any, uh, or... um, there were the email server domain names, those three domains. We could have tried to sinkhole them, but um, no, we didn't. <laughs> um, I think part of it is once. So I'll get to your question. I got another question. Um, once we discovered the mobile malware, it was on their server, and so we did hit their server to download that mobile malware and to get those list of carriers, and we did that on a Friday. They noticed our traffic and shut down the mobile server that weekend. So at that point, we knew we, we tipped the hat that we were on to them, and now they know it, and so we knew we really should release soon. And, and so we did, and that's about the course of action that within a week or two we released our, our paper at that point. So yeah, I mean, they're watching. It's, it's hard to, to, to watch them without tipping the finger that we're on to them. Do you have a question? Yeah, like, how did you discover the malware? Did the client call you, or did you notice it in the sensor? So we, had, we noticed it in a, in a sensor, and um, it was actually, we were watching for that exploit. We knew that exploit come out in April. We knew it would be a hot topic. So we were seeing who was using that particular exploit. It's looking for documents that had that signature. It was an OLE uh, overflow. I don't. I can't give you the details. 1761. Then the other question is: you you started seeing documents uploaded to CloudBee. Did the client ask you to like intercept those documents? Or so so that down. Or? With, with this, it's, it's kind of a hard topic. Like I see stuff going up. But it's encrypted. It's all encrypted, unique to that guy, yeah. right? And in fact, what we found out is, so there, there was a, a username and password for each malware, and then it had a path for upload and a path for download. And we kind of we figured out or assumed or concluded that the same username and account was used for each target found, like business, but different paths were used and different encryption keys for different targets within that business. So a lot of times we'd be able to see a document going up, but we wouldn't have the key to that document. Um, in fact, I never actually was able to get or see anybody's PDFs or Word docs de decrypted. Um, but did your clients ask you to stop that? So none of, we, we reached out to any of our clients that we knew had this, but um, we also are privileged to samples that are not necessarily within our network, and that's where a lot of these samples came from. So and there's cases, where they're not our customer, it's kind of hard to reach out to them. Hey, I, I'm a cus I'm a, you know, I, I'm a sales guy from Blue's Code, and I think you've got malware, and you need to turn this off. They're not going to believe my email, so it's hard to reach out to people that aren't directly my customers. But where they were our customer, we tried to reach out to them. Uh huh. Yeah, and that's kind of fuzzy. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Um, it, in and of itself, we couldn't really trust it at all. Um, because there was the other factors that kind of hinted that way, we thought maybe we could trust it. But you're right. That's totally not something I can rely on at all. Yeah. In and of itself. In hindsight, do you think you could have done more to cover your tracks that you were investigating them? Yeah. You or I could have been a little bit more cautious hitting their server to pull down the mobile malware. Um, it's kind of a trade-off, though. Um, you have to hit it one way or another to get the content. Otherwise, if I never would have hit the server, I never would have hit, got any of the mobile samples. So it's a trade-off of, do I want the sample and try to play it slow? Because if I play it slow and try to play it cautious, I wouldn't, maybe I'll, they would find me still and I wouldn't get as much data. 
And we went the route is we want to try to harvest as much as we can as quick as we can. And even then, we weren't done harvesting before they shut us down. In the white paper, is there a, uh, a, a would you describe what methods that they were using in detail to try and detect you? No, I don't know. We just assumed. I don't know for sure how they detected us. I'm assuming they looked at their access logs and they noticed that somebody from not Russia was there. That's my guess. I don't know for sure. And, and the, you know, to me, am I still being recorded? Robert? <laughs> sure, please. <laughs>